Good afternoon. Welcome to Chai Time number 17, I think it is. Uh, so it's, we're still going strong throughout the lockdown 2.0. Um, I'm on my, uh, I was just saying to the guys before we started that I'm using this second lockdown as a way to regenerate my liver. So I'm going to be off the beer on this one, I'm genuinely on the chai. So um, hopefully, hopefully I can last out till the end of that. Um, this chai time is going to be hosted by uh, uh, one of my colleagues, Kirsty, I'll introduce her in a second. She basically joined the team uh, less than a year ago, but she's been like a um, she's been like a whirlwind within the company, really engaging with everybody, helping us build the fund, grow the fund. And she was very keen to do a panel on the knowledge intensive area and space. And she's assembled a really strong panel. So without further ado, I'd like to hand over to my esteemed colleague, Kirsty. Perfect. Thanks, Neil. Hi, everyone. And I'm also trying to keep up to Neil's goodwill and doing tea today as well. And we'll carry on for as long as I can with him on his lockdown journey. Um, so before we get started today, so obviously today's focus is on knowledge intensive investing and how it's going to spur the growth of the biotech world. I'll just take a couple of seconds to introduce my panel and then hand over to them just to do a bit of background on themselves. So first of all, we've got Mark Brownridge, who is the Director General of the EIS Association. We've got Martin Hall, who so it's a Dr. Martin Hall, who is um, from Hardman & Co. Um, Hardman & Co. provide analysis in the fields that we're in and for investors. And excitingly, we've got Andrew Woodland, who is the Chief Scientific Officer of a really exciting spin out coming out of Dundee called Infoderm, which the fund is about to invest in. So Mark, do you want to just go first and just say a couple of a few things about yourself? Yeah, sure. First of all, I'm feeling particularly dumb today because I think I'm the only doctor, not person who isn't a doctor on the call. So uh, apologies for that. Um, oh, so yeah, I'm the, I'm the Director General of the Enterprise Investment Scheme Association or ESA as we're better known. Um, with a trade body for the EIS and SEIS industry. So um, what we do, we do two things. We work with government and Treasury and FCA and HMRC and all the fun people, really, to look at legislation about how EIS and SEIS works and uh, just trying to make it bigger, bigger, better and more effective. And obviously, we're doing a lot of that with companies at the moment with what's happening with COVID. Uh, and the other side of it is doing advice for information. So doing things like this, really, just trying to let investors know how the schemes work, letting the, uh, entrepreneurs and startups and scale-ups let them know how it works. I'm uh, just trying to bring all the different communities together all in one place so uh, so they can do business. So, yeah, that's us in a nutshell. Perfect. And Martin? Uh, thanks, Kirsty. Uh, yeah, my whole working life uh, and academic life has been uh, about pharmaceuticals and healthcare. Uh, I used to work for a drug company, an American drug company based in the UK, uh, sort of reached the middle management level what seems an age ago now, which it was uh, back in the, uh, the late 80s. Um, and had the opportunity to move into the city as a pharmaceuticals and healthcare analyst. Uh, and I've never regretted it. And I really felt that it was bringing that industry experience into the city has always been a strength. And I think it's even more so today. Um, I love my job. And as I say, people ask me why I still keep doing it. And my answer is there's never a day goes by without me learning something new. Perfect. And last but not least, Andrew. Hi. So um, I'm lucky enough to be Chief Scientific Officer for Infoderm, which is a new company that spun out of the University of Dundee just uh, August time this year. So we are uh, at the later stage of our seed uh, raise at the moment, and hopefully we'll be working with O2H going forward. So my background is primarily drug discovery science. So I worked for a CRO company called Biofocus for a few years. And then joined uh, a small drug discovery unit in academia in Dundee. That was seven people at the time. Um, we grew that to over 100 uh, staff members. So one of the largest drug discovery organizations in the UK, I think now. Um, uh, yeah, and then this is me just spinning out and trying to get back into the commercial world. Perfect. Okay, so I'll just do a little, another little introduction. So this week's Chai Time comes off the back of um, O2H Ventures. We've just received the HMRC approval for what we are calling, well, it is actually the first HMRC approved KI, Knowledge Intensive Fund in the market. So I thought I should just start off with a little bit of background to what Knowledge Intensive Funds were about. 
Um, so obviously the government wanted to strengthen and grow innovation in the UK and EIS, as Mark will tell you soon, has always been part of that plan. And it was how do you get money into R&D and startups and really grow that space? Because obviously the rules change around EIS and how you, you, know, you had to feel about early stage investing more. So obviously key to us at O2H is life sciences, biotech and AI, and they fit that space exactly. So as a result of some consultation work, we've now been approved and it gives the opportunity as well for investors to increase the amount that they invest in EIS. So historically, investors can invest a million pound a year. Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark, at any point, by the way. And then, but now, now it can be at two million as long as one million is put into knowledge intensive funds. So Mark, should we start with the EIS element of, of the conversation? So we both know that the core aim of EIS is to get tax and money moving in small and medium sized businesses. How do you see, you know, knowledge intensive funds helping improve that and to get money moving and moving forward? Yeah, I think uh, the easiest way to answer that question is to, to have a bit of a history lesson, unfortunately. So uh, if you'll allow me, I'll do that. So um, knowledge intensive kind of spun out of um, the government review back in 2017. So government policy is really important here when it comes to knowledge and intensive because um, the review that happened at that time, which was called the Patient Capital Review, was looking uh, across all of the sector, really, so across all of VC, across all of PE, looking really how we kind of take companies that we start up in the UK. We start up 600,000 companies every year in the UK. We're one of the biggest countries in the world at starting or best at starting companies. But what we're not so good at in the UK uh, is scaling up those companies. So I think, well, whilst we're number one at starting them, I think we're number 12 in scaling them up. So somewhere between starting up and scaling up, we're losing those companies or they're going abroad or they're going to China or America or we're just losing them in some other way, shape or form. So, so how do we keep those companies, number one, but more importantly, how do we scale them up to be really big companies and, and grow the Facebooks, the Googles, the, the Ubers, which we don't really have in the UK. Um, so the reviewer is trying to look into this, how we can try to help some of these companies along that journey, how we can get bigger uh, pockets of cash of investment when companies need it. And there's two pinch points. One was at the scale up stage. So when you, when you are a successful company, you need to go up to that really big stage. You need perhaps, uh, you know, 20, 50, maybe even 100 million pound investment. You know, that's a difficult area. But the other one, and probably more, uh, more relevant to what we're talking about today, was at the very earliest stage. So, so companies that are knowledge intensive, as we now call them. So those are companies that are in some of the sectors that we've already talked about. So AI, probably more biotech, medtech. Uh, that sector. So these are companies which have great ideas, great innovators, obviously Andrew's one of them, for example, um, but they find it hard or it takes a long time more to the point to get to the point of revenue, let alone profit. So it might take, you know, five, six, seven years. Andrew will tell you better than I do how long these things take to come to be, but it can take five, six, seven years to get even to a revenue point. So that's difficult for an investor to see an exit point. For an investor, you want to kind of get into, your, get into the company, see it be successful over a couple of years or a number of years. And obviously you'd see an, ex an exit point perhaps in five, seven years. But the knowledge intensive companies, uh, it takes a lot longer to do that. So how can we make those type of schemes more attractive to investors? Uh, and that's where essentially the knowledge intensive EIS um, fund was born. It's trying to expand what we already have in EIS. So we've already got some really generous benefits, you know, 30% tax relief, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but how can we make it slightly more generous to try and divert some of that cash that goes into normal? fintech type companies that EIS is so good at um, helping fund, how can we get some of that money into knowledge intensive companies? So, so that was the, the genesis of the knowledge intensive funds, trying to help that particular sector, trying to shine a light almost on that sector uh, and create um, a bit more of an even playing field between investors who are investing in normal EIS type investments uh, and push them towards this end of the, the sector. So, so that, that's pretty much where it came from. Okay, perfect. And so, so we both know a bit, bit more about the background of EIS and we both know, you know, there's been about 31,000 companies that have benefited from it now. And obviously we want to, we, we've both been great advocates for the market. And we both are really keen to grow that. Do you obviously knowledge intensive brings in some slightly different tweaks around it. So, you know, an investor can go into the fund now and carry back to last year. So, that, you know, they using they can, they, sorry, they get the tax relief from when they invest rather than when the investment is made by the fund do you think that will this year maybe drive some more business in in the eis world and in the field that we're in uh that's very much the attention again going back to kind of government policy as to why they're doing this so they feel that, that putting a particular fund that is specified in this area will raise around seven million pounds or seven billion pounds for this sector so so that's why it's being put into place because they feel like that can unlock some capital within the system um 
And I think it has a good chance because we know every year that through EIS, 31,000 um, individuals claim tax relief for EIS. But we know wider than that, there's about 500,000 high net worth investors in the UK. So that gives you an idea of just how much headroom there is in terms of people that could be investing or have the wherewithal, the assets or the cash to invest in EIS. It's just trying to obviously get them, get to them, find them, market to them and let them know that this type of scheme exists. So I guess that's the challenge, trying to find more investors, trying to find more investors with the right type of risk attitude, with the right capacity for loss. And just making them understand that one, this is a sector that is obviously up and coming, and I'm sure Martin and Andrew are going to talk about that in a second or two. Um, but yeah, one, you know, it's up and coming. There's some great opportunities. We've seen valuations come down. Uh, we've seen some great companies kind of born out, not just the coronavirus pandemic, but you know, before that as well. So, so there's great opportunities. Uh, there's lots of investors out there who EIS and SEIS haven't touched yet. Um, and hopefully, the non gen intensity fund will kind of corral some of those investors and, and find them and, and bring them towards EIS uh, more than they have done previously. Perfect. So, Martin, it seems like the opportune moment to bring you in there um, as obviously getting back to KI in the field that we're in. So biotech, AI, therapeutics is perfect. I know you've been doing a lot of research recently on the effects of COVID and just the general market. How, how much to the forefront do you see a change in the interest to investing in this um, as individuals, but also what KI does bring in? It brings in a, you don't have to take the tax relief. So do you think it's a good way that we can get early money into UK therapeutics? Yeah, um, Kirsty, well, in my opinion, uh, what was underappreciated by the market uh, before COVID-19 came along was that there was a tremendous uh, number of world-leading technologies that existed within some of our smaller life sciences companies in the UK. And it's a fact that many of these companies have struggled to attract new capital, really what, what uh, Mark was just alluding to. Um, struggle to attract new capital in the last 12 months and, and of course that's depressed the share price because investors knew that they needed money um, and of course it's very detrimental to the founding and to the early investors uh, in those companies if they're unable to participate in what becomes a diluted funding round. Now this strong technology base uh, has been highlighted by COVID-19 and many of those companies that I've alluded to there have been both ready and able to step up to the mark with, for example, new diagnostic tests to detect either active virus via PCR tests or previous exposure through antibody or asthma tests, uh, and moving these tests from being lab-based to point of, a point-of-care rapid test, which uh, obviously the government's hoping we're going to be um, able to generate in the millions um, in, the next, uh, in the next week or so. And of course, you can add to that the potential for vaccines, where you know, one of the... Oh, I think, we, I think you're, on, you're on mute now, Martin. Sorry, <laughs> I'm not sure you got to. <laughs> um, I think I'd said about potential vaccines yeah, as well. That's exactly where you are. Um, so the rapid response by some of our life sciences companies uh, showed just how advanced and adaptable certain of these technologies were. Um, and, and of course, the significance of that has not been lost on some of the major players. And I won't name any, but you know, there's been several company takeovers and there's been several company, major companies willing to tie up with these small UK-based life sciences companies. And, and I thought you might like just a few examples to back up the statements I've been uh, going through. Um, the first one, obviously, is Gene Drive. Um, the company was absolutely desperate for new capital at the beginning of the year. And if we're being perfectly honest, there were very few takers at 7p a share. Uh, its technology uh, could be adapted for COVID-19 diagnosis, both on a lab-based test and a rapid, uh, longer term, a, a rapid test. And suddenly it was able to raise an oversubscribed £8 million at 80p a share, 10 times, 11 times the level it was trading at uh, before COVID. So, I mean, very good example of one. Um, a vector which I consider to be a next generation and an improved form of ABCAM in terms of business model. Uh, it too was struggling most of the first quarter in the 15 to 20 peer share range. 
um, announced a COVID partnership with a major US company and then was able to raise 48 million pounds at 120p in May. So it was really highlighting how much more money was available um, to these, uh, the, these really good um, companies that we had in the UK. And the third one I picked was Omega Diagnostics, again, short of cash, trading at 6 to 10p most of the first quarter. And then it became part of the government syndicate for testing and was able to raise £11 million in an oversubscribed placing at 40 per share. So the, just these three examples, um, I think as Mark's alluded to, is just the tip of the iceberg. So yes, COVID-19 has been very positive for the life sciences sector, both in terms of the valuations um, mm -hmm. and also in terms of the amount of capital being injected into the sector. Perfect. Just before we get on to Andrew's experiences so far, just one, one more quick question. So obviously biotech's actually one of the top performing fund assets over the last decade. Do you think with the like of knowledge intensive funds, we, the UK can really help spur that growth and you know, get earlier capital into these opportunities so they're not having the same problems? Uh, I, I, think, I think that's a, a very good question, Kirsten. Your timing really couldn't be more relevant. Um, I'm not sure if any of our listeners um, are aware of Arix Bioscience. Um, it's a quoted venture capital company doing very much the same things as you're doing. They like to use their knowledge and expertise uh, to get in and support companies through very early stages through to the sort of Series A and Series B rounds. And, and it's developed a portfolio of 16 companies over the past five years. Uh, now, if we uh, go back to 2018, it made a six and a half million dollar investment in a company called Velos Bio, um, a private West Coast uh, US based oncology company. It followed this in January of this year uh, with an extra four and a half million uh, second tranche to the Series A. And uh, yet again, a further four million in July of this year in a Series B round. So it's taking its total investment uh, to $15 million in just two years. And yesterday, uh, the pharmaceutical giant Merck & Co bid $2.75 billion uh, for Velos, uh, and it valued Arik's estate at $185 million. So it giving it its first trade exit with a return of 12.3 times over two years. So events like that really help. Um, and, and it shows how, I think it's a really good example, um, highlighting how knowledge to assess and make the right investment, coupled with entrance at an early stage of development, can reap you know, very significant rewards. Um, I suppose I should point out in my capacity as an analyst that uh, not all investments will generate the same result, uh, but you only need one or two like that to generate super, super normal returns um, over anything else you can do. And compared with what you can get with money in the bank uh, today, um, you know, they are absolutely tremendous results. Perfect. Yeah. So obviously, Andrew, what Martin was alluding to there is obviously bigger fundraisers, but you've been you've been living through the startup experience recently, you know, your university spin out. What's your experience been like fundraising in the obviously the pre A series, getting some earlier money into the business? So uh, so we're, we're, we're quite lucky coming from a university. We did have some, I suppose, some initial research that came into the company. We had some money from Scottish Enterprise as well to be in a Scottish company. Um, we, we we're quite lucky that we've got a nice ecosystem here in Scotland for pre-company stage. So that was enough to give us some sort of kickoff pilot data. Um, so we're a therapeutics company, we've got a couple of products. One's a, a cream for uh, inflammatory skin diseases, and the other one's an oval, a novel oval mechanism for anti-inflammatories. So we we actually went, we quite quickly decided we weren't going to stick to just uh, looking in Scotland for money. There's, there's a very, very small ecosystem um, just in Scotland. Um, so we went national and came down, down south and spoke to European, UK investors. Um, and we spoke to, we actually spoke to a range of investors, including VCs. So we were, we were scoping really to understand, you know, where the market would be interested in investing and at what scale, um, you know, could we, could we attract larger investors at an early stage? 
And I would say uh, we had some good traction. You know, we spoke to a lot of VCs. They, they, they were quite interested, like the science, like the team was great. Um, but we were just too early stage. So um, we, we, we came to the conclusion that we needed to find a seed investor that could help us get the technology to the next uh, Davis point. Um, uh, and, and we started to look at seed investors. And, and O2H was, that, uh, was, was one of maybe 10 investors that we'd spoken to in that space. Um, and I, I would say, you know, it, it definitely fitted well with, with O2H. I think the, what we'd seen with small investors is they often didn't, they didn't, uh, they were nervous about entering into therapeutics, um, particularly angels. Um, they didn't always understand, I think, the pathway that would be taken. Um, I think one of the advantages of working with a, a, a firm like, like O2H has been that they have ex pharma people working for them. Um, so they have a proper due diligence team that you don't see in many other seed stage investors. So that was great. You know, we were able to interact in a meaningful way. Um, we could share our vision, um, um, share the data, uh, and get to decision really quite quickly. So, so yeah, I think um, I think we've had quite a good journey. When I mean, we only span out just uh, what August this year, so we, 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 you know, I think we've we've moved quite quickly to to raising a seed, um, and I think looking forward to series a there's definitely a supply and demand problem at that stage there's not enough companies getting funded at the early stage so that they can make it to the right value point to to raise series a uh, and I, i'm pretty confident that that the seed investment we have now will get us to the next value point and and that there's a lot of demand for companies at that stage at least quite nicely into mark so obviously um the hope is that KI will explode into the market and you know, there'll be more people investing in these areas. Obviously at ESA, you don't just speak to product providers or you know, to investors, you speak to companies looking for cash as well. What are you, are you seeing a lot in the kind of biotech AI space in particular? Um, yeah, yeah, so, it was, so we're broad, broad church, as you say, in that sense. So, uh, so yeah, it's, um, it was, it's, it's been growing over the last four or five years, I guess, um, again, kind of going back to government policy type stuff. Uh, back in 2017, 2015, EIS was kind of refocused. So at one point, um, we had kind of these low risk or capital preservation type EISs, which were effectively companies that were looking to get some kind of um, backing to the EIS or some kind of protection uh, within the business. So it might be an asset backing, for example. Um, but that all got kind of moved away. The windows got shut on that. Uh, and we moved very much into to kind of three things, really. When we speak to Treasury and government, um, the three key words. So it's growth, innovation and technology. And obviously everything that, that Andrew does uh, and you guys do at O2H, you know, fits squarely and fairly into that, into that hole. So, so it, it's, it's been, it's been coming before that, but uh, I think that probably uh, accelerated that process. So there's a fair few fund managers who are obviously in this area now, the biotech, medtech, uh, life sciences. Uh, I'm afraid you're not the only one as well, you know, Kirsty, yeah, but know. <laughs> yeah, there are some other fund managers who do the same sort of stuff. Um, but certainly uh, more importantly, perhaps uh, investors are starting to, uh, to get to grips with this area as well. I think, Initially, they, they kind of like that lower risk capital preservation type uh, investment, but, but now they're starting to understand why this is important. Um, they're starting to understand how exciting some of the companies that Andrew's just been talking about uh, are. And also they can see the opportunity for obviously their investment going from here to up here somewhere. So uh, slowly but surely they're coming on board. They're starting to understand. I think it's difficult sometimes for um, kind of the lay person to understand some of the technology that you the, uh, the biotechs and the medtechs use. So there's a bit of an education process there to try and get them up to speed with how it all works and operates. Um, but that, that's happening thanks to, again, to, to people like yourselves who can kind of lay it out from a bit clearer. Um, but now they're starting to understand, they can make their investments. Uh, so they are, they are starting to come to the party a little bit more, I think. So I think that's a trend that will only continue. And coronavirus, again, has just accelerated it all. I guess actually the question I was going to ask Martin when he was talking there is, do you kind of worry, Martin, that there'll be a, a kind of bubble around all this kind of medtech investment and biotech investment? Um, or do you think it's just kind of catching up from previous years? Um, I think there's an element of catch up, but no, I, I, th I do see that it has, it has opened up investors' eyes as to some of the quality of the technologies that we have in this country um, and that they were you know, significantly undervalued. Uh, and and I suppose the point why why I think it's not going to go away is the M and A activity um, in the in the sector has been unprecedented in the last six months, uh, and uh, actually quite uh, obviously the example I gave was an exception. 
Um, but there's been some fairly good valuations attached uh, uh, to, the, to that M&A uh, activity. So the point is that uh, uh, big pharma or major players globally are looking at that UK at those UK technologies and finding them very, very attractive at very attractive prices. So I don't, I don't think it will go away. Um, you know, I, I listened to what Andrew said, and I, I sort of sympathise. I think there have been a, not a large number, but there has been a, a growing number of funds with life sciences background and experience. I went through a period in the early um, sort of 2005 to 2013, where I tried to help a number of um, small companies like Andrews to raise money. And the problem we always found at that time, we had the common, um, you're too early type uh, answer. But the actual, it, was, it wasn't so much that and, and the company, that the um, institutions didn't like um, the technology or didn't believe in the technology. It was just that they, they were just so slow at making a decision. And you know, Andrew has people to pay and a, a company to run. They haven't got the um, they haven't got the, the, the capital behind them to to run for over a year, while one investment manager is sitting there trying you know, because he can't make a decision. Uh, I think the fact we've got more funds like this creates uh, two things. It creates a little bit of competition in those funds. Secondly, I think there's much more EIS money available. Um, and thirdly, it gives those funds the opportunity to actually quite quickly syndicate together. Um, to help uh, companies like Andrew, and that that wasn't so easy to achieve, um, you know, fifteen years ago. Andrew, just going back to your experience, obviously, you know, we, we see a lot of university spin outs. How are you seeing the university spin out market? How much do you think you know things like knowledge intensive funds will be able to they'll be able to benefit from? Yeah, I, th uh, I think it's. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, go on, Andrew. Yeah. I, I think it's a great fit for university spin-outs. Um, I think spin-outs uh, spin coming from university, I think we're quite unusual. Um, uh, I often describe myself as not being a very academic academic. I'm quite business-minded. Um, but I, I think a lot of spin-outs need time. They need to build the, the, the team. They need to build their understanding of how to be a business. Um, and, and I think that that's important to get that foundation in place before going for bigger investments. So that you're, you're, you're ready to take the money on and run. Um, so, yeah, so I think that it's a, it's invaluable. I think it's a great opportunity in the UK that we have these tax schemes um, that, that greatly incentivize uh, people to invest in a very tax efficient manner. Um, um, and then you couple that on to the, the high returns on investment that you do get in life sciences. Um, you're taking the risk out, but you still, you still have a large chunk of the potential benefit. Um, so yeah, I, th I think it's a great scheme. Um, and it fits well with an early stage company in terms of values that you can raise. Did you want to add something, Martin? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, I think it's also important that um, the, um, the, the venture companies are, are rational about valuation and you must keep the management teams incentivized because ultimately if they didn't have uh, that uh, technology and we're prepared to share it with other people. I know they're looking to you to help invest uh, in it. The reality is if they didn't come up with it in the first place, uh, then the investing companies wouldn't have anything to, to support. Uh, but so many times historically, you've seen that the founders and the people behind that technology almost get wiped out um, because of um, two um, low valuations put on companies in those early stages or too much of the equity has to be given away um, to the early investors. So we must always support the, always recognize and support the founders. Perfect. Sunil, I was wondering if you could just pop back in just so we could just ask you about deal flow and what, what you're seeing in the market at the moment. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, uh, it's, I don't know if it's because we're one of the few early stage funds that focus on therapeutics or it's because of COVID and the spotlight that it's placed on our industry. But we're seeing an unbelievable amount of deal flow, quite frankly. We're literally on back-to-back -back Zoom calls, just trying to you know, review and understand all the different opportunities to try to work out what we should invest into. So we are, are definitely seeing a, a, an amazing amount of deal flow um, in the therapeutic space uh, right now. Um, 
and that's from universities that may be experienced entrepreneurs who are spinning out starting something else themselves it's people coming out of other companies uh, maybe out of big pharma with an asset or an idea and wanted to get started so on the deal flow side i think it's just been a it's just been very, very busy. I can just say that. Um, and we are constantly reviewing new opportunities. Right. I mean, I guess, I guess the, the big question for everyone is, you know, what does, and maybe everyone could take a turn with their opinion. What do you think the future looks? So Mark's obviously going to have a more financial background view on it. And how do you think the future looks for life sciences, early stage investing and, and where it needs to go? Who wants to go first? Pick, pick out a hat. <laughs> I'll go first. Why not? I'll give everyone else time to think of their answer. But um, look, it's kind of in the prequel, we sort of discussed there was a huge amount of money coming in our sector, uh, partly due to the spotlight that COVID's put on the importance of, of having a homegrown um, a, 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 a place where you can develop your own science, your own drugs, your own vaccine. So there's a huge amount of emphasis on trying to create a homegrown sector in a way. Uh, UK punches well above its weight in the biotech space for many years. It still doesn't punch quite as anywhere near as even one part of the US. So we've still got a long way to go. But in terms of, you know, pan-European or globally, we are, uh, you know, we're in a very strong place with extremely good universities and technical capability. Post-Brexit, we're going to need to be creating high value jobs. We need to find other things to do other than the more traditional things that we've done historically. So you know, the government is obviously naturally focused on trying to boost the biotech sector. So there's a, a big opportunity for us here. The, the concern I have is I think that we will be able to start new companies and we can, things like EIS and the knowledge intensive funds uh, and other things, SES as well, shame if we can increase that, but things like that help us to start companies. And it's probably the one thing that we have in the UK that the world is jealous of for sure. Um, but you know, may, they may have other ways to start companies. In the US, they've got NIH and they pump, pump, you know, research funding into startups. Um, but, you know, we can get our companies off the ground, funds like mine and others, we can work together to take them through that, you know, quote unquote, value of death, get them to a series A. We can bring in money from other countries. We can bring in money from the US, uh, uh, Japan, you know, and other areas around the world into those companies that are series A. It's kind of de-risked at that point, and let's call it, it's in growth mode. In biotech, it's never quite de-risked and they're always at the realm of the next experiment or the next trial. Um, but let's just say you're in a, in a growth stage uh, company by then. The, the, thing, the opportunity that I think knowledge intensive funds may give is that, you know, we need to scale our companies and keep them. We always think, how can we keep them local to us? And not necessarily that's our strategy, but I'm, I'm on the board of the BIA and it's something that we discuss quite a bit as to how we try to keep our biotechs in the UK, creating more value, more taxpayers money into the coffers of the government and creating those high value jobs and keeping them in keeping that locally. Now, the problem that I see is when you get to a certain stage, you're going to need to either IPO or sell out to a big pharma. Although we have a couple of strong big pharma in the UK, and many of them are outside of the UK, and the natural path for a lot of these companies will be to list. Um, UK companies or non-American companies that list on NASDAQ generally perform better than even the American companies that perform NASDAQ. And there seems to be a natural draw to get our companies listed on NASDAQ. And, um, you know, therefore the ownership would be away from, you know, typical UK. So it's really about, I think there's a huge opportunity to, to create wealth, to create high paying jobs and a huge opportunity for the UK if we get this right. I think the knowledge intensive funds really help because you could put more money into these companies in a, in a very efficient way. Um, and the, the, the main thing for KI funds for me is that when we speak to investors and say, look, if I invest my money in your fund, can you guarantee me you get your uh, tax breaks this year? And obviously, you know, you do your best to invest in a, a yearly cycle, but you sometimes you just can't help the fact that, you know, legals take longer or you just didn't feel comfortable make, making an investment. And you don't want to make an investment uh, in, a, in a bad company just because of, you know, you get your tax break. You want to make your investment in good companies. And I think the big thing, the huge thing that KI funds bring is that the predictability of when you get your tax break. So if you invest into a knowledge intensive fund on April the 3rd, it doesn't matter when I deploy it up to a certain window, I've got a much bigger window, but there's, you know, I will be able to, you know, give you your tax break in the, the point you put your money into the fund rather than when I deploy the capital. So I think, you know, that's one of the bigger, I think for most people, whether you invest one million or two pill, it's, it's at a lot of people's reach, although we do have one or two big ticketed investors. Um, it's, it's very much about, you know, making sure you've got a, a, 
from a financial planning point of view when you can invest. And I think KO funds allow you to put bigger money, more predictability on the tax breaks. And I think it really helps. But I do have this concern of where do we go? You know, how, how do we protect the life science sector of the UK? But it's kind of a broader issue. Yeah, okay. And Mark, do you think the future's bright? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, so I talked at the start about the kind of we've been doing work for government and treasury at the moment. So that, that's our focus, at least, trying to, to work with government about how we can help some of these small companies that haven't been helped so far through uh, through the coronavirus pandemic. So we obviously we've had, uh, as I call them, the four horsemen of the apocalypse in terms of C-bills and Future Fund and Bounce Back loans and, and Innovate UK loans. So they've all been good at doing what they've done. Um, but one, they're all debt. So not all companies can service debt. Um, not all companies are in revenue or profit. So, so that doesn't help those companies. And there's a whole swathe of companies that uh, the Future Fund, for example, doesn't cover as well. If you haven't raised 250000 in the last five years, you can't get funding for the Future Fund. So there's a whole bunch of companies that haven't had any funding through there. And also equity funding uh, can really accelerate your growth, not just kind of let you, you move along a, a snail's pace as debt does. So so the two can work alongside each other, but equity funding can really kind of fire you forward. So, so we're doing uh, a lot of research at the moment as to what the fundraising experience is with companies, what investors are looking at. You know, if they're not investing, why they're not investing, how can we tease them back to the market? Because I think for a lot of investors, risk is still off the table. Um, you know, it's, it's early stage investing. We know that's risky. We know the failure rates. Um, so how do we get investors who don't need necessarily to invest at the time to come back and invest at this point? Um, so is there ways we could, uh, you know, change tax reliefs or them or have windows where we could move it around or just change some of the rules generally so that's what we're trying to get to to make some policy recommendations to government um obviously we've got a budget coming up not in november anymore but probably looks like it's going to be march 2021 so that's an opportunity for changes uh, and the other big one for us is because we're, we're kind of old money so we're still on the legislation books so any change we have to make to the rules has to go through finance bills and all the fun of the fact they're there but also more importantly than that is the eu state aid rules um because we Again, have to get any changes ratified by the EU. There's not a great deal of appetite to deal with the UK on a uh, kind of small issue like EIS at the moment. So, so kind of 31st of December, then Hose interview. So if there's no deal there, that, that actually helps us as an industry because um, that uh, moves EU state aid away quite quickly, albeit probably UK state aid or something similar will come into place. But we would have more control over our legislation and how it works at that point. So, so we're quite uh, enthusiastic. We've had some really good conversations with um, the economic secretary. He's very enthusiastic about getting EIS involved. You know, the Chancellor has seen our previous recommendations uh, and was disappointed he couldn't find a role for them at that point. But certainly we're, we're kind of hoping in on the end of the year and looking towards the budget and, and seeing some changes that would hopefully expand and, and help companies that we just talked about here in terms of KI, for example, the biotech, medtech, all across the tech sector, quite frankly. So, so yeah, we are cautiously optimistic, I would say. Perfect. And I guess, Andrew, for you, it's more about where would you like the future to go? <laughs> So uh, yeah, I think I think for ourselves, we're obviously very focused on our next investment round. <laughs> so securing yeah. investment, growing a company, being you know, doing the job that we're promising our investors we're going to do, um, and then securing uh, Series A. I think there's I think there's still um, uh, a supply and demand problem uh, for Series A investors. There's not enough good companies for them to invest in. I think there's a there's a real opportunity for early stage investment to bring assets forward companies forward that can then benefit from the money that's 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 available because of the the big exits that, that martin was highlighting um you know there's a lot of money to be made if you are successful um so yeah i think we're very optimistic we're you know we're looking forward to our next steps and uh yeah we'll, I'd, I'd like to i'd like to ask uh, martin a question we can answer Kirsty's alongside it but um it's, it's partly due to the, the, the mention that a question i've had around the markets um I mean, you obviously are active and understand public markets have been working there many years. Why is it that we can't, uh, uh, we're not, the, the London stock market or AIM is not an attractive market for biotechs? And what could, what could be done to make it a better market, a more liquid market for early, early stage biotech? And is your recommendation to someone uh, like uh, Infoderm at Series B to think about a crossover fund into, into the US? Um, and it's a good question, um, Sonal. It, it's, um, I hate to say this, but I think it goes back to, um, I suppose we call it a blip that happened you know, over 30 years ago now. But when, um, you know, British Biotech, to all intents, and, uh, it was not a, first of all, it wasn't a biotech company. It was a traditional pharmaceutical company, but it called itself British Biotech. Uh, so it, it, it tarnished 
the whole sector with what was tantamount to fraud that, that they committed. And the London market lost about 150 million pound on that. And it's unforgiving. Um, I think that the change that's taken place in the last few years is that those fund managers with the long memories have sort of moved on to different things. Uh, and, and therefore you've got new fund managers coming into play uh, and, and it's almost like starting afresh. Um, and just when that was sort of starting to go quite well, and, and the, the one that springs to mind is Circassia, um, about five years ago, coming to the market uh, and with a very attractive uh, valuation. But unfortunately, um, of course, th they've been hit very hard by the fact that the, um, the, the product didn't work. So you know, ultimately, it comes down to being able to deliver um, on, on, the, on the, um, the products and the, and the new drugs. Um, but I, I, I would also add to that, that I think from um, your perspective, the one thing I see that you can do, uh, which is really important, is when there was investment going into biotech and medtech uh, in this country, everybody, uh, the, the few funds that went into it, all focused on Oxford, Cambridge and London. And you know, there's, there's very good technology in other centres than those three in the UK. And I think you've got a much broader approach and the new EIS funds is really helping uh, you know, York, Newcastle, Nottingham, Dundee, Bristol. There are so many good companies coming out of all these universities and EIS is really helping that and taking a focus away from just uh, the big three. Uh, so I'm very optimistic about that. But uh, ultimately, I think all that we've got to be looking at is the fact that um, in a big pharma or even mid-size, mid-cap, mid med-tech and pharma are snapping up all of our technologies. And so it just shows that there's such demand for new and interesting technologies which we're developing in this country. On that note, I mean, it would be good for people to understand the kind of things that uh, knowledge intensive or EIS funds could support and help and the impact it could have on patients. So I'm going to come back to Andrew here. He kind of skirted over his technology because it's in a, a you know, disease target in the autoimmune or anti-inflammatory area. Um, maybe you could just uh, put, give a bit more flesh onto that as to what you're actually developing and if it works, what kind of patients uh, would be impacted and could support it. Yeah, so I suppose our lead product is a new oral medicine, so that's a pill to treat inflammation. And we think that the mechanism is uh, suitable for use in things like eczema or asthma, but also autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, Crohn's. So, so, you know, an asset, an autoimmune asset is great um, because there's a lot of indications you can pursue. Um, e almost every big pharma company has... Uh, autoimmune diseases of one or one form or another on their shopping list um, and, and the license flow is very rich in that space and a lot of excitement about new therapies coming to market so you've got the jack and helters which are, are, are looking very exciting or, or are already very exciting um, but they have some concerns around safety so I think there's a lot of opportunity for new mode of action therapies and the, there's definitely appetite in big pharma um, as was mentioned I think earlier or, or maybe just before the call when we were talking with us within ourselves you know big pharma out uh, it does only about 50 percent of its R&D now it, it looks to license in about 50 percent or, or more of its R&D so there's a big draw from a downstream customer that that, that means it's great valuations for successful companies so yeah so, so on the, on the, just to give people an idea of what those numbers could be, because I think biotech okay. is very different from other things. So if you're yeah, yeah. even remotely successful with your seed funding that you get from us and others, um, do you think you'd be able to partner at that stage? Do you think you need to do a Series A first? What kind of money do you think you need to raise and what money would you get back? Sure. Okay. So, um, so the, the, it depends on what's happening within the market, but there, are, there have been cases where there's been hot targets. So War Gamma was a hot target. Um, we saw three acquisitions within a dermatology space, um, all between 200 and 500 million. And that was at drug discovery stage. So before you even went into the clinic. So you said uh, those numbers very quickly. Could you just say them again? Oh, sorry. <laughs> a Scottish as well. Uh, 200 to 500 million um, deals. So that's for, how, for, for most that's, people looking to invest. I mean, that is an unbelievable 
yeah. return and, on, and, on yeah and that's where we are just about today so um you know with a small amount of development you you can occasionally get those i think that they're definitely exceptional most companies will be looking to take products into the clinic so uh, post our seed so we're looking for about nine hundred thousand pound seed we'll then need about six million series a and potentially about uh, 15 million maybe a bit more series b and that'll take us to what's called phase 2a clinical trials so that's uh, it's about a five-year journey for that piece um uh, and phase 2a is when you test your drug for the first time in patients and if you can show that it works and it's reasonably tolerated you're looking at valuations hundreds of millions um, billion in eczema for instance a company called zirco was acquired by novartis after a phase 2a trial i think they actually failed some of the endpoints um, for about a billion dollars. Um, and that's pretty indicative of a, a good new mechanism, um, even in a relatively niche disease like eczema. Uh, thank you for that. Um, Kirsty, do you have back over to you? <laughs> oh, yeah, I think, I think we're, we're good to round up there. I just want to say thank you to the panel, first of all. It's been a really good conversation. Um, and obviously, at O2H, we're really excited to be launching our new knowledge intensive EIS fund. I'm sure all of our followers will see more about it in the next few days. And the first closing will be coming up very soon. I know Sunil doesn't let me do my marketing bit, but I'll just stop it, stop it at that there. <laughs> but thank you everyone. And thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank Kirsten. you guys. Bye. Thanks for having Bye.